Okay, so let's talk about sort of the basic functional unit of our liver, our liver lobule. Um, and uh, the liver is made up of about 50,000 to 100,000 of these lobules, depending on a uh, sort of inter-individual variation. And the lobule is basically where all the physiological work of the liver gets done. So to, uh, our lobule consists, firstly, on uh, the inside of it is a centrilobular vein. And around the centrilobular vein we have hepatocytes. And these hepatocytes are sort of stacked on top of each other, uh, almost like um, a stack of Pringles. And they're stacked around each on top of each other and they are placed in position around our centrilobular vein. And then these stacks, um, so if we have our centrilobular vein here and stack one here and stack two here, our stacks are separated by vascular sinusoids. And around the lobule, uh, so notice around these cylindrical stacks, we have uh, portal tracts. And these portal tracts consist of our hepatic arteriole, our portal venule, our bile cannuliculi, lymphatics, and nerves. Now we can further subdivide our lobule into acini. Um, and where our liver lobules meet the portal tract surrounding the liver lo uh, lobule, that is where most of the fun physiological stuff happens. And this area is referred to as the atomus. So that would be the portal tract as well as a specific component of the liver lobule that it supplies. And I'm going to show you on a drawing a bit later exactly what I mean by that. Okay, so the functions of the liver can be influenced by the nerve supply to the liver. So we need to touch on that uh, briefly. Our sympathetic nervous system supplies the liver from T6 to T11. It makes sense that we have sympathetic nervous supply to the liver. After all, uh, when we are excited or running away from a saber-toothed tiger, our adrenaline is pumping and we need to be able to break down um, glycogen stores into glucose and we need to start uh, the gluconeogenesis process to make more glucose to give us energy to run away from the tiger. And then in the same way, uh, when our parasympathetic nervous system activates, we need to start digesting food, make glycogen, digest proteins, convert proteins, so it makes sense that we have parasympathetic nerve supply, and our parasympathetic nerve supply is from the right and the left vages. We've also got some fibers from the right phrenic nerve, and some autonomic fibers, synapse at the liver via our celiac plexus, some autonomic fibers are via our splanchnitch nerves and synapse directly in the liver. Okay, so we've discussed the lobule and now the question is how does this thing work? Well, I've mentioned the portal tracts which have our hepatic arterioles supplying oxygen uh, to the liver and then our portal venules taking in uh, blood from the rest of the body um, to the liver and uh, blood from these arterioles and the venules mingle in those sinusoid channels which are present in between our Pringle stacks of hepatocytes. These sinusoids themselves are lined by endothelial cells and they uh, have Kupfer macrophage cells which are also known as Borovich Kupfer cells. Um, Kupfer was a German scientist who discovered these cells but he was not able to clearly identify the, what they that they were macrophages. Borowicz was a Polish scientist who discovered them about a month before Kupfer and published his results about a month before Kupfer. Not only that, he correctly described that they were macrophages. However, at that, at that time German was sort of the language of science and for sheer, the sheer power of marketing Kupfer managed to get his name associated with these cells even though he had no clue what they were doing and the Polish scientist Brovich sinked into obscurity everywhere except his own home country and the country surrounding Poland. So in Poland they're referred to as Brovich cells and the countries around Poland Brovich Kupfer every else, everywhere else as Kupfer cells. Anyway, blood drains through these sinusoids into our centrilobular vein and what happens as the blood goes from our hepatic, uh, from our portal tract to the centrilobular vein, uh, foreign material or dead material or whatever material that can be macrophage, uh, 
macrophagocytosed will be chowed by our macrophage cells. All right now, inside our Pringle snacks of hepatocytes, um, we have cannula forming for bile. Um, and these bile cannulas start sort of at near the central lobular vein, at sort of the apex of the stack, and they radiate outwards. And bile is formed by hepatis hepatocytes and secreted into the cannula. Not only that, but we also have lymphatic channels radiating from out uh, of these stacks. Now, uh, the endothelial cells in our sinusoids have large openings, which are also referred to as fenestrations. Uh, so, in a sense, there's no barrier between the blood and the hepatocytes. So, blood can easily um, make contact with the hepatocytes, and hepatocytes can take up toxins or materials uh, or whatever it needs um, from the blood and then can dump those toxins um, into the lymph or into the bowel cannula, for example. As I mentioned, Kupfer cells project into the lumen of these uh, sinusoids and they phagocytose bacteria and foreign particles. Okay, so here is a drawing I made of the hepatic lobule to illustrate the, um, the atzinus especially. I drew this picture myself, so feel free to redistribute it as much as you like. There's no copyright clearance required. We have our centrilobular vein in the middle of our lobule. Our lobule is this wonderful sort of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six hexagonal uh, geometric shape. And we have these columns of hepatocytes throughout our lobule. But for the sake of simplicity, I just drew this one. And there you can see all the individual hepatocytes. We've got our portal artery and our portal vein. And um, we can think of the atinus as being the sort of this triangular area that includes the portal artery and the portal vein um, and uh, hepatocytes and a small portion of the central lobular vein. And then we've got our sinusoids running between our portal vein and our central lobular vein. Of course, our hepatocytes need some oxygen. They can't be just detoxifying all the alcohol we drink all the time. So there are some also arterioles running from our portal artery to supply that oxygen. And blood moves from here into here, goes into contact with these hepatocytes, which then filters the blood, uh, as it were, takes out toxins, takes out particles, um, metabolizes medication, that sort of thing. Um, and then eventually after processing those toxins it will spit it back out into the venous system or spit it out into the um, canaliculi system or sp spit it out into the lymphatics. haven't drawn the lymphatics here but you can imagine the lymphatics coming out um, uh, as well. So bile is secreted into these bile canaliculi which start sort of at the apex of these stacks and they go out into our bile uh, canals and that is pretty much it. So this is the atinus, uh which forms a part of our lobule. Okay, so we have all this blood rushing through us from our portal tract to our central lobular vein and they have close contacts with those hepatocytes and the question arises what do hepatocytes do with all this blood that is uh, draining through the sinusoid uh, in the, in the atinus in the lobule. Well, hepatocytes have hundreds and hundreds of enzyme pathways, and because they have hundreds of enzyme pathways, the liver has hundreds of functions. And for the sake of simplicity, we can group these functions into s several broad categories. We can uh, say that part of the functions of hepatocytes are for the for formation and secretion of bile, uh, nutrient and vitamin metabolism, synthesis of plasma proteins, storage of iron, copper, vitamins, uh, and glycogen. Vitamin, the vitamins it stores would be A, D, and K. Inactivation and detoxification of various substances such as um, beer. Immune system functions and it also is a reservoir for blood, although that's 
not so much a function of the enzyme pathways, but just the fact that it has such, uh, the liver has such a rich vasculature. Okay, so we're going to discuss each of those broad categories one by one, starting with the formation and secretion of bile. First of all, why on earth do we need bile? Well, bile has two main functions. It helps with the absorption of fat, and secondly, it excretes bilirubin, cholesterol, and drugs. Um, so it helps with absorption and also as a way of getting rid of waste products. So if you have excess bilirubin, excess cholesterol, or if you have drugs that can dissolve in bile, um, bile is a way of getting rid of those waste products. Um, hepatocytes continuously secrete bile into the bile canaliculi. Um, so bile is being constantly produced, um, but ideally we want to only secrete bile when we need to absorb fat. So um, um, our liver stores this bile by having a gallbladder. So gallbladder acts as a reservoir for this bile, and while it's dead, also concentrates the bile by reabsorbing water. I'll go into a little bit more detail about that when in the gallbladder lecture. Okay, so bile consists of bile salts, it consists of cholesterol, consists of phospholipids, and now it's um, lipid molecules that have some extra phosphate added onto them, conjugated bilirubin, bilirubin, and a bilirubin type molecule, and uh, an alkaline electrolyte solution. It can also contain anything that can dissolve into an alkaline solution. So hypothetically, um, any acidic drug will dissolve in alkaline solution. So aspirin is likely acidic. So hypothetically, aspirin should dissolve into this electrolyte solution and be excreted uh, in the bile. That's also why we say um, with aspirin poisoning, you should alkalinize the urine. Um, because if you make the urine alkaline, then um, aspirin will dissolve into the urine and be thrown out of the bloodstream much faster. But that's a separate story. Okay, the hormone that in, uh, controls our bile ducts is cholecystokinin. It's released by the intestines in the presence of uh, a food bolus, and it causes the gallbladder to contract. It relaxes the sphincter of OD at the duodenum and causes uh, bile to be propelled towards the intestine and out of the sphincter of OD into our duodenum. A bit more on bile, although bile is mostly an alkaline solution, it also has some acid content in that, uh, has bile acids. And it makes sense that it would have bile acids dissolved in the alkaline solution, because as I mentioned, acids tend to dissolve in alkaline solutions. So one way of getting rid of acids is to have this alkaline solution to pump them into. So it's not at all uh, contradictory that we'd have our bile acids dissolved in our alkaline alkaline bile solution. Our bile acids are, are made from cholesterol, so this is a way of getting rid of excess cholesterol in our bloodstream. And not only that, but bile acids help emulsify certain insoluble bile components. So there might be things that are struggling to um, dissolve into the alkali solution. The bile acids can combine with them and help them dissolve, and it helps with excretion. Salts of these bile acids can also emulsify fat in the intestine, which helps with absorption. And remember, anything that helps with the absorption of fat will end up helping with the absorption uh, of our fat-soluble vitamins A, D, and E, and K. And what happens is that these bile salts form micelles with lipid molecules, which allows them to be absorbed. That uh, I'm sure you covered that in detail in Block 3, and we're not going to go into too much detail uh, regarding that. Now 95% of these bile salts will be reabsorbed from our small intestine and then will, be, will end up being re-excreted in our bile. And this is referred to as enterohepatic circulation. So the bile salts go in to the du uh, duodenum, they end up being reabsorbed, go to the liver, and then they end up being re-excreted. And this is important to understand because, as mentioned before, certain drugs are excreted uh, through our bile, perhaps these drugs combine with the bile acids, um, for example, and then excreted in the bile, uh, and then with that reabsorption uh, of these bile salts, you can actually have reabsorption 
of our drugs. So certain drugs uh, also go through enterohepatic circulation, whereby the drug is constantly being reabsorbed because of excretion via the via the bile. And a small amount of these bile salts will be lost fecally, and they will be replaced by hepatocyte synthesis of new bile salts. And let's talk about bilirubin, which is responsible for that wonderful yellow color of bile and also of jaundice when uh, we have bile duct obstruction. Bile, bilirubin is um, the end product of hemoglobin metabolism. Uh, what happens is that dead, um, he, oh, when red blood cells break down, they release hemoglobin into the bloodstream. The hemoglobin is uh, absorbed by Kupfer cells or Borovich Kupfer cells, if you want, and uh, that iron, that iron ring in the hemoglobin is broken down, and the waste product formed from this breaking down of the iron ring is bilirubin. Also, uh, bilirubin can be formed from myoglobin breakdown, so if you have been beaten to an inch uh, of your life by a Shambox and you develop Shambox syndrome which is basically when your muscle cells are leaky and they leak their proteins and myoglobins into the bloodstream uh, your liver will take up some of that myoglobin um, and uh, try and break it down to its components for recycling and with the Rubin will as such be made as a waste product Okay, so we have bilirubin and hepatocytes. They combine with albumin when they're in the bloodstream and they circulate around. This bilirubin albumin combination is referred to as unconjugated bilirubin. Now, this uh, unconjugated bilirubin can be taken up at the hepatocytes. It might never have been released by the hepatocyte in the first place, but bili bilirubin can be conjugated within the hepatocytes and they're usually conjugated with glucuronide, but they might be conjugated with many other things, and this will form a conjugated bilirubin. And um, this conjugated bilirubin will then be actively excreted into the bile canalically. <coughs> Excuse me. And a tiny amount will escape into the bloodstream in normal circumstances. In abnormal circumstances you might find that enormous amounts of conjugated bilirubin escapes into the bloodstream, such as when you have gallbladder um, obstruction, or bile duct obstruction rather. Now this bilirubin will end up with the bile uh, in the intestines, and colonic bacteria will break it down to urobilinogen and some of that urobilinogen is reabsorbed, yet another example of enterohepatic sort of cycling, uh, and then re-excreted via the bile. A urobilinogen also has a um, unique uh, ability to be excreted through urine, giving you your urine that nice yellow color. Okay, the next broad category is nutrient and vitamin metabolism, which is a huge a uh, subject that you probably went into a lot of detail in block three, and we're just going to touch on some sort of basic highlights and revision of carbohydrate, fat, protein, vitamins, and mineral metabolism. Okay, so let's talk about carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, in our liver, or well, first of all, we absorb glucose, fructose, and galactose, and uh, the liver will then convert these. Fructose can be converted to lactate. Um, otherwise, fructose and galactose can be converted into glucose. The liver can, uh, will then use glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, or the Krebs cycle, or the phosphogluconate pathway to make ATP. And the phosphogluconate pathway also makes cofactors for fatty acid synthesis. If there's too much glucose, uh, some of it will be stored as glycogen in the liver. Once those glycogen stores in the liver are full, uh, glucose will then be converted into fat. Also, the liver is also able to form glucose uh, through gluconeogenesis and forms glucose from lactate, pyruvate, amino acids, uh, especially alanine, and also from glycerol uh, or glycerine as it's known in this commercial formulation. Insulin uh, will stimulate glycogen formation, that makes sense. Uh, it wants to suck glucose from the bloodstream uh, as much as possible, and one way of so of increasing glucose demand is to increase glycogen form formation. Insulin will inhibit gluconeogenesis to prevent more glucose from going into the bloodstream. 
and then adrenaline and glucagon have the opposite effects. They will stimulate glycogen breakdown um, and they will promote uh, gluconeogenesis. Glucocortisoids, you know, it's cortisol, uh, catecholamines like uh, adrenaline, glucagon, thyroid hormone, uh, all of these guys, um, just to reiterate, will increase gluconeogenesis. So just as a sort of interesting side note, if you're a sports athlete and you hear the crowd cheering and you get excited to hear your name, you might secrete a bit more adrenaline because of that excitement and you have that burst of energy just from hearing the crowd sort of chant your name. And then if you have ever struggled to put up a drip on a very, 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 very fat patient in an emergency unit uh, who has sort of overdosed on their insulin and uh, you're struggling to get a drip up to get that dextrose, um, if you cannot get a drip up to give that dextrose, you can also give glucagon uh, IMI as a sort of uh, emergency sort of backup measure um, to uh, break down the patient's glycogen stores and uh, stimulate some gluconeogenesis uh, while you're struggling to put up uh, a drip on the very fat patient. Okay, moving on to fat metabolism. Uh, once our glycogen stores are full, as mentioned, excess glucose and protein will be turned into fat. Uh, and that and those fat molecules are turned into triglycerides, which is the body's preferred storage method of storing fat. Um, and uh, that triglyceride consists of fatty free fatty acids plus a glycerol. And um, these triglycerides can then be broken down. So they're formed in the liver and they can be broken down in the liver back into their component parts. And these fatty acids can be um, used imme immediately um, by being turned into acetyl coenzyme A uh, through beta oxidation of fat. Or they can be stored in the fat sort of uh, tissue that surrounds the liver. Um, if there's too much acetyl coenzyme A, it can be converted and released in the circulation as ketone bodies. Uh, one of the ketone bodies is acetoacetic acid. Or acetyl coenzyme A can be pushed into the Krebs cycle to make ATP, or it can be made used to make cholesterol and phospholipids, which are both cell important cell membrane components. So as much as uh, high cholesterol can kill you, you need some cholesterol to make new cell membranes and to renew your old cell membranes. Hepatocytes also make lipoproteins, in other words um, HDL, LDL, VLDL, and these guys transport our lipids uh, in our blood circulation. And briefly we're going to discuss protein metabolism. The liver is involved in deamination of amino acids and as removes nitrogen groups from amino acids in preparation of transforming to transform one amino acid into another or to plonk a, uh, or to synthesize a new molecule on an amino acid backbone. Uh, those amine groups that are deaminated from the amino acids um, are eventually converted into urea, uh, which is a way of getting rid of excess nitrogen from our body. Um, uh, it converts uh, different amino acids in, uh, into, into each other. Uh, so they're referred to as non-essential amino acids because they can be synthesized from each other by the liver. In contrast, essential amino acids have to be uh, present uh, in our diet because the liver cannot uh, make them. And then uh, the formation of plasma proteins um, is done in the liver, such as, for example, albumin, and as mentioned, uh, our sort of... Uh, protein lipid sort of compound molecules like uh, our cholesterol transport molecules of HDL and LDL. Okay, looking into a uh, bit more detail on deamination into conversion in urea. Um, so when you have excess amino acids, um, they'll have the nitrogen removed and they can be converted into carbohydrates and fats or they can be converted into um, other amino acids uh, or keto acids and um, ammonia. Keto acids can be converted by transaminases um, into any other amino acid. Uh, the ammonia, however, is somewhat toxic. It's combined with carbon dioxide to make urea. And ammonia can also be made by breakdown of proteins by colon bacteria. So one way of reducing, if you have um, liver problems and um, 
liver damage that prevents it from taking this ammonia and making it into urea and you have hyperammonemia. One way of reducing ammonia levels in the blood is to cut down protein uh, in your diet. That will reduce the amount of ammonia made by your colon bacteria and furthermore to reduce the amount of excess amino acids con uh, that have to be deaminated and that uh, create uh, ammonia. This excess urea is then excreted by our kidneys. So our kidneys are basically getting rid of excess nitrogen in our bodies uh, through the medium of urea. Let's talk about plasma proteins. Almost all of our plasma proteins are made in the liver, ex uh, with the exception of our immunoglobulins, which are made by our B cells uh, of the immune system. But pretty much any other sort of common protein in our bloodstream is probably made from our liver. And the most important are your, our albumin, our protease inhibitors, like alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, these protease inhibitors prevent sort of certain digestive enzymes or certain cell enzymes from break, um, consuming the entire body. Uh, then we have our proteases, which break down proteins, and our coagulation factors. And this is just a very small sampling of all the different plasma proteins that the liver makes. I mean, there's also procoagulation factors and various other proteins, but as a sort of highlights, we have these. Albumin maintains normal oncotic pressure, so it prevents you from becoming edematous, um, um, and is also a binding and transport protein uh, for our fatty acids, hormones, and many different drugs. All our coagulation factors are made in the liver, except for factor 8 and von Willebrand factor, these guys are made by our platelets and uh, various tissues. Other notable mentions are our pseudocholinesterase, which you'll learn more about in uh, anesthesiology, transferrin for iron metabolism, uh, there's also lots of other transport uh, proteins available for specific nutrients and uh, minerals, um, complement factor, uh, which is part of our immune uh, system, C-reactive protein, uh, inflammatory sort of marker and uh, lipoproteins as well. At this point I want to delve a bit more deeper into plasma proteins and uh, some clinically relevant aspects um, of the uh, coagulation factors. Your liver makes uh, pro uh, your coagulation factors that promote coagulation, so for the sake of the slide we'll call them pro-coagulation factors specifically factor 2, factor 7, factor 9, factor 10. Uh, you can look up the coagulation and cascade in any good physiology or hematology textbook. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Not only that, but you also have anticoagulant uh, factors, protein C and protein S, and what they do is they inhibit your procoagulation factors to prevent excessive uh, coagulation, and that is how homeostasis of coagulation is maintained. And um, these enzymes, or these factors, are created through vitamin K-dependent enzymes and processes in the liver. Now, these um, some of these procoagulation factors are very long half-lives. Factor two, for example, has a half-life of up to 50 hours. And um, the anticoagulation factors have short half-lives. For example, protein C has a half-life of about eight hours. Now. Um, there's a drug called warfarin, which uh, you might use uh, in the state sector. It's, uh, there are now better alternatives to warfarin available, but um, depending on budget, you might still be using warfarin in the state sector when you start doing your internships in the, st in the state sector in a few years. Warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist, and what happens is actually prevents the synthesis of these factors by su uh, suppressing vitamin K dependent processes. Now if you think about it, uh, warfarin starts working immediately and it whacks out your um, synthesis of anti and procoagulation factors immediately. But your procoagulation factors are going to hang around for quite a while, up to three days, while your anticoagulation factors are um, going to dissipate in a few hours. So the clinical effect of your uh, 
Okay, anticoagulation factor is going to dissipate uh, in a few hours, and the procoagulation factor clinical effect might take up to three days to be properly diminished. As in the first three days, warfarin acts works as a procoagulant by inactivating anticoagulation mechanisms such as protein C and protein S, and after three days, it's an anticoagulant by finally knocking out 2, 7, 9, and 10. So you'll see if you do end up using warfarin uh, during your surgical rounds for a patient with deep venous thrombosis, for example, um, then uh, for the first three days, you're also going to give heparin. Uh, on top of the warfarin to knock to prevent that um, procoagulant effect. Okay, we're briefly t touching on vitamins and minerals. Hepatocytes store iron, they store copper, they store A, D, E, K, and also vitamin B12. And as mentioned earlier, you need bile to absorb these guy uh, fat-soluble vitamins. So not only do they store A, D, E, and K, but they are essential to absorb them in the first place. If there are disorders in how the hepatocytes store um, these things, we can have a sort of um, uh, excess sort of um, nutrient syndrome. Um, too much iron uh, can cause uh, liver damage if you take in too much copper. Uh, or you have Wilson's disease, you're going to have liver damage. Taking too much vitamin A, you can have liver damage. Um, just as sort of uh, three brief examples. Okay. okay, so we also have inactivation and detoxification of various substances happening in our liver. We have our drugs, toxins, exogenous substances, and hormones, and these guys can all be transformed in the liver. And there are two sort of classical reactions the phase one reaction and the phase two reaction. And the phase run reaction involves um, oxidases or a cytochrome P40, and typically there will be some shuffling of electrons, so donation of electrons, or oxidation, acceptance of electrons, or reduction, self oxidation, so remove electrons and uh, add in a sulfur group, a removal of an alkyl group, or addition of a methyl group. And an important example of a molecule that can be broken down by the cytochrome P4. 50 system is our benzodiazepines. Our phase 2 reactions um, involve conjugations. So we take a molecule and then we add a glucuronide, a sulfate, a taurine or glycine uh, on top of that. And then these conjugated compounds are then excreted in our bile or in our urine. Now the liver reacts uh, to, or has a f almost like a feedback mechanism happening, so that if it's uh, breaking down one sort of particular drug, it will then activate more or synthesize more enzymes to break down that uh, drug. And this especially happens with cytochrome P450, whereby uh, when you have a drug that is broken down by cytochrome P450, the hepatocytes will reflexively start making more of that um, cytochrome P450. And that will then upregulate the elimination of any other drug uh, that is broken down by cytochrome P450. Alternatively, some drugs inhibit cytochrome P450, and that prevents the breakdown of another drug. And so, typically, what will happen, uh, a sort of a classical sort of uh, worst-case scenario: you have a patient uh, who is on benzodiazepines, and then you prescribe an antibiotic or an antiplatelet or something that inhibits cytochrome P450. And they are taking more, and the patient takes more of their benzodiazepines than usual. Um, and then, because of the inhibition of cytochrome P450, they then end up having a relative overdose of their benzodiazepines. So, when you have interdrug reactions, uh, most of them are caused by messing around with cytochrome P450. And then sometimes uh, our breakdown products are actually more active than the parent molecule. For example, paracetamol metabolites are actually more active than the actual paracetamol molecule um, itself. And then let's go into immune system functions and the reservoir functions of the liver. Uh, obviously, bacteria that enter through the gastrointestinal system are going to end up in the liver, where they will be chowed by our Kupfer cells, um, and then. Cellular debris, viruses, proteins, particles, anything that uh, needs to be filtered uh, after absorption from the gastrointestinal system will be removed by those macrophages. 
Okay, so uh, as in terms of the reservoir function, um, the blood pressure system in the liver is a low pressure system. Uh, that tends to, uh, that means that blood pools in our sinusoids. That um, causes that allows the hepatocytes to have more time to interact with the blood. Uh, if the blood is rushing past, the hepatocytes not going to have time to absorb all those toxins and things um, because blood pools in this low pressure system. There's more contact time between the hepatocytes and the blood. And not only that, uh, that also means that the liver serves as an emergency storage facility um, for blood. And it stores about 350 mils of blood. When the systemic blood pressure drops, uh, for example, when the patient is in shock, um, the pressure gradient between the uh, systemic uh, circulation system and this low pressure sinusoid system will drop and then blood will tend to shift from the sinusoids into the systemic circulation. So that's an emergency sort of 350 mils of blood that can be shunted into systemic circulation. Alternatively, um, if you're having heart failure and you're struggling to get blood um, through uh, the body because of uh, congestive heart failure, um, you will the liver can prevent um, the formation of edema uh, and systemic effects of heart failure by increasing the amount of blood it stores. So in a sense, uh, the, blood is the heart is having ha a hard time pumping all the, the entire blood volume. The liver will then suck in sort of blood volume to reduce the load on the heart. If you think about the treatment of congestive heart failure, you will often give them a diuretic uh, so that they urinate uh, a lot and reduce their blood volume uh, to reduce the load on the heart. In the same way, the liver will attempt to store more blood uh, in congestive heart failure. It will store up to one liter of blood to reduce the total amount of blood that is circulating to try and take the load off the heart. And that is why with congestive heart failure, you will often have a congested enlarged liver on your clinical examination. Those are my, these are my references uh, for the lecture. Uh, I hope this lecture was useful to you. I used an anesthesiology book for this lecture. Um, when it, what I like about anesthesiology books is how uh, they discuss physiology more from a clinical uh, viewpoint. So quite often if you're struggling with physiology and struggling to understand the clinical applications of physiology, just go grab a good anesthesiology textbook. Uh, for that physiology and often they'll explain it in a very clinically relevant way.